Well, uh, talk about someone who's struggling at the moment. Uh, same as energy <laughs> has really had a bad couple of weeks. Uh, latest go around here is they're talking as of probably 24 hours ago. They anticipate almost a 5 billion euro uh, loss this year due to Siemens Gamesa, essentially. And that has increased dramatically. When, when, this, when this first Siemens issue popped up, they were talking about a couple hundred million euro sort of event. They knew they had a problem. They weren't sure of the scope. But it's multiplied by a factor of more than 10 at this point, And it's really starting to shake the marketplace. Bill, have you seen some of these uh, financial discussions that are happening in all the newspapers? Absolutely. And even just this morning, there was a Reuters news piece where they interviewed two uh, financial analysts from JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank that said that they're not even going to look for profitability until 2026. Uh, so if if that. So this, this is a, a very serious situation um, for Siemens Gamesa. One that I don't... I think there's, you know, there's there's uh, something to be said for transparency, but then there's also being a little too honest. And to be blunt, I think they're being a little too honest with the market right now about what's obviously you want to be able to provide and, you know, visibility to, to what's going on. But to come out, I mean, the company has actually come out and, and said that we basically sold dodgy products, you know, that were, un, you know, not tested and proven enough to be actually sold and, and be viable in the marketplace. And this is making their entire situation a lot worse. And they're doing it to themselves. And I don't quite understand how their PR and marketing people signed off on this. Um, so that's, that's a big open question. It must surely be worse than they're saying, and that's the the reason why they've been permission, given permission to say say this, right? That's my take on it. That um, you know, like they're saying really bad things, so the reason must be that it's actually much worse, and this is better that people think that they, they've done this bad, really bad thing compared to what the reality is. I mean, I've got nothing to base that on except for just the same as you. Like, how on earth did anyone approve this messaging, unless? you know, this is the good, the best case scenario that they could, um, you know, possibly tell. Well, usually when companies of this size get involved in a financial problem of this magnitude, they actually will hire PR firms that specialize in these kind of events to give them advice. Because it, it doesn't sound like Siemens is taking that advice at the moment, or they haven't hired that company to do that. Because it takes a certain kind of personality to know how to n navigate those waters. And if you haven't done it before or don't do it for a living, it, it can be quite treacherous because the marketplace is, is super aggressive right now. Uh, all the financial analysts are really sharpening their pencils and sometimes sharpening their knives. And it, you have to be careful what you say, when you say it, how you say it. And right now, I think, Phil, I think you're probably right. They're, they're just too honest. They're, they're too open at the moment. They need to hold steady for a little bit, figure out what's going on and come back with that plan. It's going to be brutal for the next couple, couple of months, but I, I don't see how you move forward without some sort of PR plan. And, and let's also talk about the long-term consequences of this for a second. So if you remember back five years ago when Senvion went under, um, Intel Store and you know myself and my colleagues, we spent uh, months and months trying to convince three different companies to buy Senvion. Uh, to no avail, uh, no, because frankly, nobody wanted to absorb the debt. And the question here is that in spite of the fact that the Siemens Energy has said everything's on the table, including presumably selling off Siemens Gamesa to someone else, who would buy it with this much liability exposure? Because again, as I've mentioned, I mean, the fact that they've made these public statements, it's not just it's bad for their stock price. They could be opening themselves up to litigation based on knowingly presenting products in the market that were faulty. Uh, and and there's so there's a whole boatload of consequences that could come from this. Um, so long term, we're going to I'm going to handicap a, a little bit and let's talk about what what's likely to happen if they survive. As the financial analysts have indicated, it's probably years before they're back to any kind of decent financial health. If they don't survive, you could see an asset strip the same way you saw with Senvion. And if that happens, 
There are actually several Chinese companies, some Indian companies, um, and even you know more mainstream Western competitors that might gobble up some of the assets. So certainly, their service portfolio is potentially attractive, especially since they acquired some of those service contracts from Senvion um, when they when they did that asset strip uh, a few years back. Uh, but this this could be the way this goes if they can't figure out what happened and why it happened as you suggested alan i'm i'm a little fearful the other the other thing i'll mention real quick too is you know if you're spending if if the company is now spending uh, a significant amount of their budget on propping up the manufacturing side of the house there's also a risk here to the long-term service contracts on the services side Meaning that if I'm an independent service provider right now, you know, I'm going to first go get a subscription to Intel store and our great biz dev tools, <laughs> but I'm going to, no, really, like, I'm going to start calling every asset owner that has a long-term service contract with Siemens Gamesa to figure out whether or not they can break that contract and, and maybe sign up with an ISP. I mean, in, in, you know, kidding aside, like that is a likely outcome of of this there there could be some significant consequences oh absolutely and rosemary i saw some numbers here about the quantity of turbines and what the specific issues are so they're saying there's 2100 4x machines and 800 5x models that are out in the field currently uh, obviously not all of them have issues but there seems to be two main focus areas at the moment which are going to drive all these numbers wrinkles in the rotor blades in terms of the ply layups and some sort of debris in the bearings. The wrinkles in the rotor blade, I do not understand how at this point we have the quantity of wrinkles <laughs> in, in, a, in a manufacturing such situation, which Siemens obviously knows about. Yeah, wrinkles are super common defect it's probably yeah i mean between lightning and wrinkles um that would cover the bulk of the um the blade issues that i get involved with uh, in my work so i don't think that the, the fact that wrinkles emerge is uncommon and it is something that can take a, a little while to find out that you've got that problem um because the kinds of quality assurance that they do in the factory the kinds of testing that they do doesn't always pick up the wrinkles. You can do um, various kinds of, of scans like ultrasounds or, you know, similar to the kinds of scans that you do on a, a human body. You can, you can do that to find defects in a blade in the factory, but there, it, it depends. You can only do certain tests in certain areas. And for wrinkles, you can really only check where the lamina is quite flat. So you can usually catch them over most of the, the really critical parts at the main lamina, the spar cap. That is pretty flat for the, for the most part. Um, so you should be able to scan those in the factory and pick up wrinkles. But I've seen many instances where they're just not for whatever reason. It's not a totally exact science. Um, so they make it out in the field and because you've, you've weakened the, the blade strength a, a little bit, but the main problem is on its fatigue behavior. So, you know, it's those little loads replied repeatedly. That's the problem. It's not a matter of, you know, you turn the wind turbine on and the first time that the wind bends it, that it's going to snap. It's not that big of a problem. It's that it's just got this weakness, this little stress concentration where the wrinkle is and that after a few loads, um, it, you know, it might be after a day, a week, a month, a year, maybe two years, you've had enough bends, uh, enough stress concentrations in the same place that it can cause that failure. So you can imagine if it's happening after a year, then you've already made a lot of blades in the meantime. Um, and if that wrinkle wasn't present on their test blade, then that wouldn't have been picked up in their, their testing because it's not present on every single every single blade, right? Doesn't Siemens have a unique way of building blades that's a little bit different than everybody else? They do, but they don't build all their blades like that. So their, their unique way is they do have a one-shot process where instead of making the blade in two halves and then um, gluing them together, they can lay everything up and I think that they use these pressurized bladders to kind of make the second half of the mold and push everything out and they can actually cure a blade in, in one go. But um, yeah, definitely all their blades aren't 
made by that, made like that. Well, because he's the latest generation, the 4X and the 5X series, would you would they not be using that process? Uh, I think that they don't necessarily always use it for the really long blades. Uh, I, I'm not not an, an expert, and yeah, I wish I I, I had checked. Check my my notes to verify exactly what kinds of blades they do and don't use that for. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not I'm not 100 sure that this these blades would have been produced like that. Um, yeah, I've never heard of worse quality for that that kind of blade than than others. I think they're only using that manufacturing process for the uh, blades that use the carbon protrusions in the spar. I don't think they're using it for the carbon glass hybrid blades that they have. That's my understanding. Yeah, and if they've got pul- protrusions in the spar, then they shouldn't be able to get wrinkles. Um, that's the, the, the point, you know, like you've already got your carbon kind of laid out into a solid piece um, and then you put it in. A wrinkle happens when... Uh, usually a wrinkle happens when you lay the fabric in the mold and you know it's got a little a little bump in it and it could be for a few reasons it could be because someone your worker left a a marker pen in there or something and the glass is going over that Um, it could be because you put it in kind of sideways a little bit yeah skew if um, and and as the vacuum was applied it kind of pushed it together or um, yeah, it could be because of a, a vacuum issue or, or something. But basically, instead of it's like with composite materials, it's super important that the fibers go in the right direction because you know the fibers only transmit the loads along the length of the fiber. It's like you know, imagine if you're trying to I don't know push something along with a piece of spaghetti. If you if you push it uh, along the the long axis, then you know that would work. But imagine now trying to do it at ninety degrees, and you're just going to snap that piece of spaghetti, right? And so when you put uh, a wrinkle into a blade, then instead of having the force, um, the loads going nice along, you know, in the straight direction, at some point where there's the wrinkle, it's going to be going on an angle, and it's like that, you know, piece of spaghetti. It can it can break break there where it's pushing, you know, across um, at a yeah at a ninety degree angle or or something smaller than that compared to what it should be. So that's where you usually see these problems introduced. But the interesting thing I noticed in um, the reading that I've done this week is that they're saying that they're blaming the wrinkles on a supplier issue, which is really weird because it should happen in manufacturing unless they're buying protrusions with wrinkles in them, which is, I've never heard of that. That is bizarre. I mean, that's literally the point of why of why you you go with um, protrusions so that you stop, you know, the ch- some of the manufacturing challenges. And yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible, but I would be so surprised. And keep in mind, they don't have any um, contract manufacturing of the carbon glass hybrid blades. They're manufacturing all those in-house at this point. So I'm really confused as well as to how this happened. I wonder if it's like a, manu- um, a, a vacuum supplies issue or um, mold issue or you know like uh, could it be some other supplier other than the but the, yeah the the glass or the carbon fabric itself just seems really strange to blame a wrinkle on the supplier of the fabric I can't imagine what would be wrong with that fabric that would cause a wrinkle I, I mean I guess it's possible that there's something I haven't I haven't seen every <laughs> every kind of possible failure um, ever but it's a weird one yeah, it is weird. It does. I read multiple reports about this that they're eliminating suppliers from their supply chain at the moment uh, because of quality issues. So, if it's something blade specific, it probably is something like a protrusion or a mold or something of that a resin system, something or the way that they're injecting resin. Something weird has happened there, and they're trying to figure it out still. But I, like Rosemary said, it's going to be very hard to to figure out exactly what's the causes and to eliminate it and make sure you actually have it eliminated. But uh, wrinkles in fabric are becoming more and more an issue. We're going to talk about that with TPI as, as we as we move forward today. Uh, so, you know, things aren't well at Siemens. Vestas reported a second quarter loss, uh, mostly due to supply chain disruptions and projects being delayed and trying to get the supply chain up and running again. It, it although Vestas is is it seems to be one of the strongest um, OEMs at the moment. They are trying to refocus a little bit, trying to move some projects forward, but it looks like pretty much every manufacturer is is struggling at the moment. And 
trying to figure out a way to steady the ship and right the ship and also um, set themselves up for a, a, a growth future. And Phil, if there was any company I was going to pick that was going to have a profitable second quarter, it would have been Vestas. And, and now even Vestas is at a loss. They are, but I'm certainly, I mean, certainly compared to Siemens Gamesa, less concerned. Um, the other good news for Vestas is that they have gotten, you know, some long-term relationships established, uh, one with Iberdrola, um, that actually Gamesa and Siemens Gamesa used to enjoy, um, with with Iberdrola being an earlier investor in in Gamesa. Um, so the, they everybody's suffering right now based on the fact that we're still ramping up to um, order deliveries in late 2023 and early 2024 um, that are going to see a lot more cash come in the door. Um, so this is kind of the consequence. If you remember like six months ago, there were a number of companies that were kind of slowing down or shutting down production. GE was one of them as well. Um, and so this is just kind of the consequence, the lack of profitability in the Q2 is kind of the consequence of, of some of that. They just weren't able to recognize as much revenue in the second quarter as, as they would have hoped. Um, but again, they're, they're not doing poorly right now. They've got a decently sized order book globally. Uh, offshore might be a bit of a concern because of delays throughout Europe and elsewhere um, as per their uh, CFO as well um, has come out and said that some projects could get delayed or canceled. Uh, so there's some downside risk there, but for the most part, um, we don't see a, a long-term issue for them. <laughs>